welcome everybody. It's 515 here. We have folks here in the room from South Africa, Puerto Rico, I'm sure a few other places. But I am very happy to report to the folks joining us online, thank you so much for joining, uh, that everyone looks bright-eyed. So this, I, I, yesterday we had an afternoon session and it, folks were starting to kind of hit that time zone lull. I think we're going to have a little more energy today, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Did I just sing? Oh no. my gosh, I think I did. <laughs> um, I am supposed to remind you all, this session will be recorded. Uh, we just caught her dancing and my singing. Um, by joining the session, you are consenting. Um, and of course, if you should not wish to be recorded, you're welcome to leave the session. No, not those it. in the back near the door <laughs> um, and view it on demand later. Uh, so with that, let me introduce ourselves. I'm Jen P. Is that it? <laughs> That's Is that it. it? <laughs> uh, so I'm Jennifer Parrott. I'm the GPM uh, from the developer division focused on all things testing. Uh, in particular, my focus uh, and background for the last decade or so has been on Azure. So I really like to help folks building Azure services, how to help test for resiliency and reliability. My name is Debbie O'Brien. I'm a senior program manager at Microsoft, and my main job is advocating for and building up the community of Playwright. And my name is Max Schmidt. I'm a senior software engineer in the Playwright team as well. Nice. And you guys are both having a pretty good time at Build, right? We're like Playwright everywhere. So if you have not heard of Playwright, uh, you've been on the .NET floor or something. Or the, or, AI. Or the AI floor for too long <laughs> and you need to get down here. <laughs> so for today's session, um, again, we were guided to make sure that you all know where, what room you're in and what questions we think we can answer. Um, anything related to automated testing. I would love to hear questions that maybe are not specific to the products that we are representing, um, because I'd love to take those back home with me, even though some of them I can answer, some of them I may not. Still love to hear what's top of mind. Um, and then of course, anything, any questions, any topics you wanna cover with Playwright, Azure Load Testing, or Azure Chaos Studio. We will have some folks online. Again, thank you for the folks joining us online. We'll be watching the online chat. So if you have some questions, uh, please post them there. We do have some SMEs on the online chat. We also have Max here who's going to help us in the room, both for questions in the room, getting them on the mic, as well as if he sees something on the chat. Any questions we don't catch in today's session, do know I'll be logging on right after, working with Debbie and Max to make sure we get those answered. Uh, so do know that if you, your question was asked and it wasn't answered, look back. We'll make sure and get those answered. And feel free to like just put your hand up and stop us in the middle of anything. This is yeah. a kind of a discussion. This is not a you sit and watch and then ask later. Just interrupt us. You're more than welcome. We're here for you. Absolutely. So last couple of slides really quick. Um, I, for folks who did not by chance make our virtual lab, um, I did want to highlight that we have this app, demo app available out on GitHub. It has demos of Playwright, Azure Load Testing and Chaos Studio. It's quite a robust application because we really wanted something that would feel more real world to all of you with those kinds of tests that you can use. Um, so that is there available for you. Feel free to file any issues um, as well as requests for any other types of testing samples. So I wanted to make sure you saw that. Um, and then we'll come back to this and we're probably gonna hand over and switch over to Debbie's machine. Well, first of all, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. There you go. You told you I was going to test you all. Um, first of all, why are you all here? To learn. I love it. Not a trick question, but why are you all here? What do you want to learn? What did you want to see from this session? Mm -hmm. For load testing, right? We've got some load How many people would like to learn about load testing in this room? All you tests. All te Any kind you. of testing. You're, you're my friend. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone else here for something? Yeah. Uh, strategy. Strategies around Fabulous. testing in CICD, amazing. Yeah, uh, for, for how to invoke both tests, but then which tests to include in that GitHub, because that's the strategy part. Okay, we may have to hold on to those questions. That was a lot of them. That was cool though. That was really awesome. Should we, oh, I got one more. Yeah, oh, excellent. So a question around Chaos Studio. Studio and actually simulating regional outages. Brilliant questions. 
All right. Ha -ha. Yeah, it got... might be an Azure room. I think oh, it's boy. very much an Azure room, but that's only because they don't know what Playwright is. Is <laughs> anyone here using Playwright? Perfect. Yeah, thank you, okay. thank you. But I just wanted to make sure. Um, so there's one or two people using Playwright. Let's, Any of you here um, want to use Playwright, just haven't used it? Like it's in your kind of like, oh, it's something that I want to do. Excellent. Okay, oh, brilliant. Fabulous. So, so the to-do list will be complete after today. You're going to go home and you're going to write tests. That's the the um, the mission. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to like jump straight into what should, where should I start? Actually, where would you like me to start? Um, so I I, I only know a little UI. bit about a playwright, but you keep raving about this whole UI mode thing. It's so so cool. I I'd love if you could lead with UI right. mode and well, then. Tell me how I can use that and what benefits it gives. Let me show you UI mode, Jen, because it is my Perfect. favorite feature. And it's I want to make new, sure so that we've got your machine coming up. I know. I'm going to do that scary thing. Share the screen. Okay, good. I was oh, like, don't start demoing and nobody can see anything. Got it. All, All right. right. So I have installed uh, Playwright using the VS Code extension uh, because it's the most simplest and graphical way of seeing uh, Playwright. So it's much nicer. But you can, if you're terminal people in black and white land, you can totally use the Okay, terminal. but I got to back you way up yeah. because I'm an Azure girl. Yeah. What does Playwright test even provide? Like, back me you way up. You don't even know what Playwright is, no. Oh, come on. Oh, my God. Okay, everyone okay. Knows. I got to keep everyone lively. But what is Playwright? So Playwright is a theater. No, no. any messy. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> So Playwright is for end-to-end -end testing. So you remember the days, Jen, where, you know, your team would like, you know, ship code to production and mm -hmm. then say, right, everyone go test the website for two hours and make sure there are no problems. And you start clicking around the web and then you start filing issues and then you go fix them. Look, they're all nodding. Yes. Yep. Right. Well, people are still doing that today, which is scary. And it's like, what? Well, I, Why are I, you still doing that? Yeah. And I still see also a lot of teams where it's like even on their front end test, they get this flaky false positive. And I'm sorry, there's this part of testing where, which I absolutely hate, which is I get a false positive. I can't repro it. So and talk to me about how we're going to. Yeah. And yeah. no, then I start ignoring tests <laughs> and I don't even write. You them. delete them all. Yeah. Has anyone had that experience? No, never, never. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, there's some folks raising the hand. All right, so, so show me how we're going to solve that. So Playwright basically helps you to automate those tests so that you're not the one clicking the buttons, but Playwright is going to click that button every time you ship that code. You put it in your CI, CD pipeline. It's going to run those tests, and it's going to run through those actions that you want to do, whether it's a shopping cart and you want to buy a product or whatever that test is running. And it's basically like flaky tests, Jen says, because what Playwright, what it has is auto waiting built in. So it's going to wait for the button to appear on the page. Maybe it needs to go and get something from an API and come back. It's going to wait for you. And then once it finds that button, it's going to click on it. It's going to do what it needs to do. And you don't have to set timeouts or worry about any of that. And it's going to retry it until it's like, you know, clickable um, and ready. So it makes life easier. And I think that's what we're really here for is we don't want to be fixing bugs, or if you're leading a team, you don't want your team fixing bugs all the time. You want them creating new features. You want them having fun using Copilot and getting you know stuff out there. So let's automate the tests. Let's create tests so they can have a better developer experience. And that's what Playwright is doing. So um, I'm, I have it installed with the VS Code extension. And uh, from there, I'm going to quickly just show you how to, how to just run a couple of tests because it's really easy. So we have like uh, a test folder in here with a very, very simple example test. And I'm going to show you before I show you UI mode, because Jen, you know this. This is what you do, right? You click on the green triangle, right? And it runs that test. And hopefully my internet is going to work and it will run that test. And you saw very quickly, I mean, you, if you blinked, you missed it. Sorry. Playwright's too fast. I blinked. So, <laughs> so it, it basically went to that browser, it clicked on that button and went to that page, right? So this was like um, an experience that, you know, is nice, but it's not amazing because you're not really seeing what's going on. And this test is literally just going to the Playwright website. It's finding a link um, with the name of Get Started. It's clicking on it and then it's expecting it to have the URL. Let me just, you know, close that browser and let me just run that again so you're going to see it pop up again. So watch. Right? Super fast, right? So imagine a whole workflow where you're going through a shopping cart experience and are filling out a form. There's no way your eyes could like track all that and kind of see, did that really do what I wanted it to do? So that's why UI mode is so helpful. And let me show you UI mode. Now with UI mode, we need to just open a terminal. 
because I don't have a button yet because my engineers haven't built me a button from VS Code. Oh, we'll be we'll be saying build us a button next week. I like I know buttons. It. <laughs> uh, so we need to do npx playwright test dash dash UI. That's to run the test using the UI mode, right? But this is actually going to be really boring. So let me do something more interesting. I'm going to take this demo to do app that comes when you install Playwright. I'm just going to move it into the tests folder because that's what Playwright's going to read from. So you can all do that at home as well. This is what you get when you install Playwright. So bang, and I run that command and a new window comes up. Now let me just zoom in. There we go and make it full screen. So this is UI mode. What UI mode is, it gives you all the tests. You, you saw very similar in VS Code, right? Um, that was the get started link, right? Which is a very boring test. So I'm gonna do something exciting. I'm gonna get maybe this one. And I'm gonna press play on this test. Now when I press play on this, actually this is the describe block of three tests. It's gonna run those tests. You didn't see anything, right? Cause I ran it on the describe block. If I run it here, Again, you'll see that and bang, it was super fast again, right? How can I see what just happened there? But now I can travel forward and back in time. And I can see exactly what happened in this test that I wrote, which is a to-do app test. So I can see here, I'm like a locator.fill get by placeholder. And down at the bottom, you can see the code that's been written as I hover back over by some cheese. That's what I did. Oh, someone's allow or deny, allow that person in. Do we allow people? Yes, okay. Absolutely. I've allowed them in the room. There we go. All right. I didn't <laughs> um, even, it didn't pop over here. I would have. <laughs> so we're feeding the cat. Um, we've got uh, get by test ID. There we're, we're like clicking that. You can see the red button here, right? So you can see this is exactly where Playwright is, is uh, clicking. And you know, you can go to the before, the after. So after it was checked off. So I can see exactly the CSS classes were applied correctly, right? And if I wanted to, um, do something in this instance, say I wanted to debug this, I could just pop this out into another window. Now I have that instance of my DOM snapshot of my test, and I can do things like inspect it because it's a DOM snapshot. And this is like really small, boom, boom. But I could, you know, come along here and hover over, let me see, did it done, like this one here, and I could see that it's got some styling and I could change that. I don't know what this will do. There we go, I can change it to red. So I can see that that should have been in red and this was the problem and I can play around it right in this state of that test. So I can go back to here and then go right, I fix that error and go on to the next and can keep continuing down. So at UI mode, you can see the action, the before, the after, all the source code. And if there was anything going on in the console, you'd see that here. If there were network requests, I don't think there are in this test. Um, what the call is doing and attachments, that's new. What does attachments do, Max? Have you ever seen that before? I think it's like for visual regression testing. Wow. So, so you could see like if you want to make a screenshot of a certain element, you would see the expected and the received element. So if we had done any visual regression tests, you would see that right here. That's only released like two days ago. This release, I think. Yes, this release. So, just nice. like two days ago. One week. So, one week ago. So that's like brand new. So that's kind of really cool as well. Woo. So one thing I've got to interrupt because I'm getting some questions on the chat. Oh, so no. um, are they easy? This one's a, I, it's an easy one, but I would l prefer you guys to answer it. Go so there's it. a great question around how does Playwright um, log into the website with credentials? And so I know that we have the documentation on playwright.dev, and I do know that Playwright does this really wonderful thing where you can do the authentication on one page, and then it will actually store um, the details so you're not having to authenticate into every page for every test to help speed up those tests. But it's the detail of how we're storing it that Max or Debbie, I might need your help on. It depends on how your authentication is, right? So it's not as simple as saying, Every, every authentication is the same because it's not. Fair. Um, but if you have like a simple authentication in your database or whatever, you can set, do a setup test where it runs that authenticated authentication before all the other tests. So you mm -hmm. run it once and then it stores it. Um, and then it just like runs, goes to that, what is it called? Storage state? Yes, storage, storage state. state. So it goes yeah. to storage yeah. state and okay. it gets those values back. So basically... So it's reusing the authentication, the local storage and the cookies. So you only lock in once. Exactly. And that works for both database as well as AAD authentication, though, doesn't it? That's uh, the demo I saw was AAD, okay. but I wanted to verify that. Uh, all, all authentication which happens inside the browser, like we okay. unlock in prompt, lock in a password, is compatible with Playwright. 
Cool. So any OO stuff and so on. Okay, I have one more question. I'm okay. sorry, there's really good ones coming in the chat, so I'm going to keep it lively here. How much commitment, and I can answer this one too, but I'm going to put it to you guys. How much commitment is there to the continued support for Playwright? Some of the engineers I've talked to have concerns with Microsoft's previous track record with end-to-end -end testing tools. I mean, I, I don't know previously what mm -hmm. happened and stuff. I've been at Microsoft for one year. Uh, Playwright's been going on for three years now. Um, and I think when you look at something like a company like Microsoft, right, you have to understand that a company like Microsoft is similar to basically all you out there. We have kind of like almost small little companies inside Microsoft. You could put it that way. So all these other teams and like if you like we're not turn around and saying we've created Playwright now everybody go and use Playwright because that doesn't work right but slowly the teams are starting to migrate over to Playwright we've seen a lot of internal teams already using Playwright we spoke to some today ourselves um, who are just like blown away by what we've shown them mm -hmm. and they're moving their teams to Playwright um, as soon as we finish build right mm -hmm. so if internally in Microsoft we're using this product then of course we're going to put like resources in it because otherwise we're not gonna have any tests. Imagine like we take play right away and then all of a sudden all of Microsoft is gonna just break teams being, how many how many teams and what? So uh, you, you need to differentiate, right? Between experiments companies do and like products where they invest time into and Playwright, I would more count it as a second option because like internally Outlook uses us being, just learned Loop is using us, uh, so many other internal product, uh, so products. The, we're, we had the front front end developers uh, team for OneDrive and SharePoint. Exactly, as well. they as well. Tons of teams. So internal coverage, external coverage, Adobe, for example, is using it as uh, NASA. Uh, they're using us for their control software where they control their rockets. So I will address one part of the Microsoft question, though, about the other end-to-end -end testing tools. So one, I'll have you... Uh, feel free to send me an email directly at genp at microsoft.com. There have been some testing tools that we have deprecated uh, more recently in the last couple of years. And a big part of that is the shift to cloud. What we found with some of those tools is they would not scale to what was needed. And so we did need to re-look at those. Some of that is like load testing. It's been a really painful one, I know, for a lot of Visual Studio users. Um, so feel free to to get, I see some heads nodding, so do come to me afterwards because I'd love to talk with you about that. Um, but that's one example where it was like, oh, wow, the way this is running and the scale that's needed and the fact that we need this for cloud and where we're going in the future has been some of the decisions there. But that is not uh, what we're at all talking about with Playwright, which is very modern, leading edge, uh, full commitment. Question. Great questions in the chat, by the way. I'm going to keep pulling <laughs> so them in. Uh, so along those lines, so is is Playwright a uh, web ba web testing tool only? <laughs> yes. Any chance in taking that to also desktop testing? At the moment, it's the most like featured request that everyone wants it because they love yeah. Playwright so much. They're yeah. like, I want to do it with my mobile apps, but yeah. that's hard, right? This is browser based, and that's what sure. it's built for. So we'd need a whole new team to be assigned yeah. to to make that even possible. It's a no. I don't say. <laughs> I would say it's a no. I don't say it's never. A no for now. It's not a never. Yeah, for Donna Mao, because Do Donna Mao uses browser-based kind of stuff. It's a little bit. You can different. just hand the microphone to him. Yeah, yeah that way he's not like React Native works as well, right? That's because fine. it's. So does it support multiple browsers? Yes, of if course. It's in Microsoft, you know, we don't want to. No, no, no. Get multiple stuck browsers. With Edge only, you know. No, yeah. so it's Chrome so based. Chrome, it's Chromium based. So, so we're like using um, Chrome, but you can test on Safari, you can test on Firefox, and you can even test on specific browsers, right? You could do Microsoft Edge or you could do Google Chrome only. So you get to choose. So, so by default, Playwright works with like three of the major browser engines, all Chromium ones. This means like you can use Microsoft Edge as well as Google Chrome, which are like both branded browsers. So you have the support of Codex. Uh, you have Mozilla Firefox support and WebKit. WebKit is the foundation of Safari, what Apple uses under the hood. And Playwright enables you to use WebKit even on Windows. There is no official Safari any, anymore which you can use on Windows. But the WebKit what, which we give you is the same WebKit, which ex like the, all the JavaScript execution and rendering is the same than there. I see two questions over there. Yeah, just want to make sure we're pulling... We're, we're going to get back to when we're using the VS Code extension. You're using Chromium just by default. That's what mm -hmm. we use because it doesn't make sense to pop up three browser windows. But you can obviously just like select one, choose another, 
or choose all three of them if you want them all three popping up all the time. But on CI, it's going to run those three unless you decide to go into your config and remove those. So I've used Cypress before. What what would the benefits be of switching from Cypress to Playwright? I would say, first of all, um, and I, I always say this, are you having any problems with Cypress? Because if you're really happy with your tests and your tests are working and your team is happy, mm -hmm. I don't see a problem in you investing like, the, is there a point in you investing time to switch over? Now, if you do have a problem, if you're paying too much money for parallel tests, for example, because we don't charge any money for parallel tests, um, uh, if your tests are running really slow, um, is your developer experience, all those kind of questions you need to ask your team. If you have kind of problems you want to fix, can you test iframes easily? Maybe you don't need to test iframes. If you do need to test iframes, we've got you covered. So there's a lot of things you need to think about of what you need, but don't just switch because we say it's cool and we want you to <laughs> do it because you need to, or because you want to. They're, they're absolutely not. doing an amazing job as well. Mm -hmm. did, yeah, did you have a question? Thanks. So do you support testing multiple versions like version pinning? I'm going to let Max um, answer that for more of an engineering style question. Uh, so for every Playwright version, we have a fixed version of the browsers which we ship. But this does not mean, for Chromium at least, that you're bound to a specific version. You can still use the last three versions and one version ahead. We usually uh, ship the better version of Chromium, so you're always ahead of what the users have. So if Chromium introduces a bug, you will see it one before. Uh, yeah, regarding stable channels, you can use always a stable channel, so you actually have the same version. And for WebKit and Firefox, these are pinned. So always the stable releases of the point in time when a Playwright release happened. Great questions. Other questions? Yeah. One more. I'm going to from before. Oh, brilliant. Yes, brilliant. Yeah. So, so Hello, hello. Hello, hello. So for, for like testing strategy, I mean, we, we use Playwright. We absolutely love Brilliant. it. It's a great product. Um, but uh, for testing, uh, I mean, for CICD strategies is, first of all, is it a good idea? I mean, do you see developers writing their own tests? Or is that sort of a testing team that does that? Uh, and then uh, how do you manage the volume of testing? If it's a complicated app, you've got thousands of tests. You don't want to run, run all those tests in every single CI/CD step. So, how, how what's the strategy to sort of manage that? So, I'm going to take that one, um, and we may have to also uh, talk at the end of the session. So, what we see is because of the breadth of variety of teams, it really first and foremost, your strategy is going to be different depending on a big part of how your organization is set up and the process you have in place. So we are talking with teams that are pure DevOps shops, some that are dev and then they have a QA team, some that are dev plus QA plus SRE. So it totally depends on what you're building as well as the process and the organization structure you have. A um, Couple of things that we are seeing, um, first and foremost, uh, and you can look, this is not Microsoft, this is the uh, State of DevOps DORA report, if anyone's seen that. Um, a huge uh, proof point of data that we see out of that is that small, like lots of uh, highly agile check-ins actually raises the quality bar. So rather than sort of that, oh, you know, what we used to do where it's like, here's a big check-in, two weeks, three weeks, one month, and then we're bringing it in up the branch and then testing it, um, that ends up having a lot of problems in terms of quality. So everywhere possible, we are absolutely advocating that folks really bring as much of the testing they can as close to the code author as possible. Now, to your point, that strategy will have an issue because you don't want to have all your tests right there with one dev and then you're running this huge suite and all of a sudden there's no agility. Um, so that's where your strategy may depend on sort of, hey, what's your process for both the PRs? Are they PRing right into a main branch, which is a true DevOps? Or is it more of a each team has their own branch and then it's a much bigger code base that's coming together? So like I said, it's really hard to answer that um, succinctly. Um, so you'd have to take all those factors into play. For the CI/CD, again, 
shift left, keeping that agility is keeping those tests such that of that code that dev is working on, he or she immediately will get that responsive feedback. So if you're working with a front end dev, they have a lot of their front end tests running. And one of the beauties of UI mode is right as they're writing code, some of those tests are kicking off right in VS code. But that doesn't mean right there as they do the PR, you're not gonna also have other tests. So let's say they do their PR, that's going into main, and then you're saying, okay, now we're really ready to go to production. That might be where you say, okay, because of the speed that we wanted to do, we're gonna trim our accessibility tests, perhaps. I mean, there's a lot of different strategies here. Um, what, what I always try to recommend is like the person who adds a new feature front end wise, writes the end-to-end -end test as well. Mm -hmm. I think the time where they had a dedicated QA team, that's not like up-to-date anymore. That's like, but in my opinion at least, not the, op the optimal approach. There's been a massive that's been, shift, yeah. Oh, that's in the inner loop, so that's like in the Yes. Right in that code, yes. yeah. yeah. We, we, we got a few questions from the internet. Let me just, one second. Yeah. So there's been a massive shift in testing and in how mm -hmm. people think about testing. So previously, uh, you will have found, say, on Martin Fowler's blog, right, about, you know, the testing triangle, and you spent all your time doing unit tests, and then the end-to-end -end test, that tiny little thing at the top of that pizza, and, like, spend as little as time there as possible. And he was right back then, because the testing tools were not up to scratch. It took too long. It took too long to run the tests. So why mm -hmm. would you do that? But now with tools like Playwright and, and other competitors out there, They've made it easier to do end-to-end -end testing. And now um, we like to test as close to the user as possible. You still might need a, a unit test, right? But not as many. Do more end-to-end -end testing than unit testing because you want to test what your user is doing. Mm -hmm. You want to really test that process. Now, previously you had that QA, as, as Max said, that QA department doing everything. I'm not saying that QAs are not needed, not at all, but the QAs can also use these tools and start making their lives um, easier and better, but working closer with the developers. And then we also need to make sure that the developers have a habit of writing tests because sometimes they don't. They put testing as a end-to-end -end thought, basically, as in something you do after. We need them to be writing the tests as they're developing the product, and it's like you always add tests, end of story. Let's definitely also take that um, further offline. And the only reason I say that is where it gets complicated is when he first asked that question, he was talking about load tests. So it does get really complicated as you start to look at some of these resiliency tests and where you want those. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great question. But you, you also want a statement, right? You also want people to have the... I'm just gonna give you the mic because there's people at home who won't hear you. Yeah. We, we also want to make sure that people get trained with the, you know, the methodologies and everything related to QA. So that, that there isn't always an expectation that all developers will know, you know, all the strategies yeah. and everything else. Yeah. So it, it's it's a little bit of maturity of the organization mm -hmm. plus information that everybody's willing to learn, right? In exactly. a startup yeah. environment, it's not the same as an enterprise environment. A hundred percent. How and many people you have in your team? We've been looking at it, so I have a hypothesis that I would love anybody um, as well to sort of help me know what's happening on your side. But basically, there is not only the size of the company, so startup versus enterprise, there's the maturity of their process, what kind of process they have in place. And what's interesting is when I say maturity, it's probably the wrong word because it's just different processes, right? And teams will have different ones. And then there's another piece which is the criticality of what you're building. So I like to use the example of when I'm talking to banks or I'm talking to folks who are building apps for first responders or hospitals, there is a whole world of difference in what you're doing there versus if you're building the app that tells you if the school bus is gonna arrive, right? And, and so that criticality plays a big part as well with some of these strategies. So it's, it's a really difficult, but great question. We, we got another question from the audience. Yeah, I mean, I was just gonna say that um, I think this is a broader question as well around CICD because now yeah. if we're talking about, you know, sort of having our testing occur in sort of batch at some future point that impacts how soon I can actually start delivering mm -hmm. uh, my, the, the value. Um, and so that, of course, 
uh, keeps us from being able to actually have, you know, more agile mm -hmm. hardening of our platforms uh, on an ongoing basis. And so then it leads to the types of challenges where, hey, this developer has moved on to yeah. work on something else, right? And maybe they're not even available anymore. And now there's an issue. And then who's going to look into this? So the more that you're, especially now that our testing tools can support it, the more that you're able to actually get those ongoing tests occurring uh, as close to the actual user as possible, the more that you're also empowering the developer to ultimately be able to be held accountable and okay. respond in a timely manner to their to their deliverables. And it's interesting, if, um, I love the way you said that, which is we want the tests that it show that user, the customer experience, as close to the code authoring time so that the developer right there is fresh in their brain, oh, what did I just change? Because there's nothing worse than just even a week later, you've written the code and you're like, what is going on? Like how did, well, let alone if it gets all the way to production. So 100% we're trying to get everything shifted left, but I really love the emphasis you put there on getting that developer that, what is that customer experience, that end to end? Really well said, thank you. Question online. I know Max, we you were trying to. As well. <laughs> Poor Max. We uh, do you want me to take the microphone and you can. You I, can... I, I, I can read a question from the internet. Okay, better than I can. Okay. Yeah, yeah we, we will come to you in a second. <laughs> Testing triangle approach is outdated, but all oh. info online seems to recommend that approach. What you, would be good resources to learn most up to date best practices? This is a great question. And. Um, I would say when it comes to like end-to-end -end testing, because that's what I focus in, Jen, you might be able to answer in a different area. But Great in end-to-end -end area, um, we we need to change people. We need to create more content. I personally follow Ken C. Dodds, and he's a playwright ambassador. Um, but he's he created the testing triangle, right? So he kind of like bulged it out a little bit and made it more kind of integrated. The testing trophy. The trophy. Sorry. Yes, he sorry. The testing trophy and made mm -hmm. it like made the triangle go bam like that, and. Um, even he today, like we'll say, it's even kind of changing because his mindset is changing based on the tools that, you know, we're using. But what is out there? We have a couple of podcasts that you'd have to listen to, but there really isn't, I don't know of any really good modern, <laughs> someone coming out there and saying, this is what you should do and this is how you should do it. Maybe I should do that. But would you all listen to me? Probably not. So I don't know. <laughs> I think it's, yeah. So, so I'm going to jump in there 100%. So we are seeing in the industry it changing. Um, I recently gave a presentation to our MVPs on this exact same thing where I highlighted our content is still showing the pyramid like from Microsoft. So Microsoft all up wants to learn and actually explore what it means now. Because since that original triangle, like I did a quick, I mean, I think the original triangle I learned in college, which I'm not going to tell you the date of that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm now I, like, I personally, I personally never learned it. Like right, yeah. <laughs> um, but but what's interesting is all the changes since that time, right? Just even in the last decade, what we've seen. So the biggest thing for sure is that as we've seen everything shift to DevOps, primarily. What even now, that's some more recent content. Oh, DevOps. It's not build and then test. Like it's like test all the way through all the way through to your synthetic monitoring, right? You want those synthetic monitors to also reflect what is that user experience. So uh, I think we're gonna see sort of this, as Debbie mentioned, this pivot, this change. But I, my belief is we may end up seeing get as close to the user experience all the way through the cycle all the way from design, all the way through build, all the way through and multiple loops and all the different testing that happens inside of that. Uh, Microsoft is definitely investing here. We want to learn with you, but we definitely want to go after testing because we see the need is so important. Everybody's building things that now first responders, hospitals, I mean, it is a whole nother world what we're supporting. People uh, are all writing of you. more tests than ever before, which is amazing and something that wasn't seen before. So it's really, really cool. But yeah, a great question. Someone asked which podcast? Um, that is a great question. It's on okay. my website. If you go to debbie.codes, it's the featured podcast on my website. It's some sort of um, testing. We'll get it for you. 
Yeah. This has been a great dialogue. Yeah, keep going. Uh, yeah. Um, so PlayY can do the authentication for the user. But once you're authenticated, you have a specific role. And I, I might want to test different roles, roles that have um, similar behaviors or different behaviors. So how does PlayY offer something to make this manageable? Or, or are there strategies to, to make this manageable? To have um, to test my different roles and uh, do not repeat the same tests uh, for behaviors that are the same uh, between different roles. Mm -hmm. That's it. Do you want to take that, Max? Uh, so let's say you have three roles, for example, right? And role num one, two, and three, and two shares the same permission as one, for example. Do you want to run the same tests again? using makes sense right so we we internally call this or we, we uh, in our documentation we call this parameterized tests mm -hmm. we, you mm -hmm. can have like you can parameterize whole project you can parameterize whole files you can just parameterize small test files uh, small tests individually and based on that rerun tests with different kind of parameters roles multiple times with different user credentials logins like it's very up to you how your application is designed to create a, a good setup there, I would say. Mm -hmm. And then run through those, okay. Yeah. Any other uh, questions on, okay. How can QAs who are not comfortable with coding can be able to adopt mm. Playwright in their mm. testing workflow? Let's go to a sweet demo Let from Debbie. Let me show Debbie. you that yeah, the yeah, De Debbie, writing test is hard, Writing right? test is so hard, and this is one do, of my things. Do, how do we write tests? We copy and paste the test block from the other <laughs> file and then we start editing, right? Yeah, no? do, do you need to learn all the Playwright API? And you have to learn absolutely everything and you got to learn accessibility to make no, sure. No, 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 started writing me a test one spec.ts file, import test expect from playwright test, and it's started the test block. You can see it's recording there. So now when I go back in here, let's go to my favorite website, aka.ms slash PW lab. PW lab. I learned it this morning. Right. So this is um, my my beautiful website that we built. And basically I want to test the user experience of buying an Xbox controller. Did I spell that right? Let's check. Yes, I've got that Xbox. And I can, you know, scroll down the page or just, oh, I didn't see that one. Oh, my God, that is beautiful. You like the bright colors. <gasps> Originally, I like the blue one, but now I, I'm I changing. I want one, too. Can you order two, Debbie? You want one as well? Okay, let's go. Now, just Wait a minute. Are a we second. shopping or are we writing We're, tests? We are writing tests. But if I go <laughs> back to VS Code, look at all that code that's just been written there for me. So Playwright is basically doing all the hard work for me. All I'm doing is clicking buttons, just like a user. This is what a user would do. It's gonna add it to the bag. And uh, as you can see, as I hover over here, um, maybe you can't see that, maybe I should zoom in a little bit. Probably can't zoom in. No, no you can't. There, 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 oh, there, there, so there was, let, let's repeat that for the internet. There was a yeah. question if uh, our coach and can automatically write a test for you. Yeah. And as of today, there, this is not possible. But we've seen on the keynotes that, you know, you can write plugins. So I want my engineering team to write a plugin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, right? Yes. I'm yeah. like, just scan the whole website, grab yeah. all the yes. elements and run. Just yes. just tell it to go and put an Xbox yes. But I think in, there was an even better cool. idea yesterday, and I cannot let go of it, which was telemetry-driven test development. So what I'd rather have is my website capturing all that telemetry and that telemetry being fed into the AI engine to then generate the test. So that's the one I'm taking to the engineering team. PM to PM, we're going to battle it out because that's the fun, isn't it? Uh, Debbie, there is get by roll button name card. Yeah. Where, where, where does card come from? So what Playwright is also doing um, is it's looking for the most accessible role on that page. So if you look at that icon, which is a shopping cart icon, Right, there's no text there. So how does Playwright know what to what to click? So it looks for the accessible name. Now, luckily, I have a great team of developers who built this, and they put very accessible code in there. And an area label of cart is what Playwright is reading from that. So if you were to inspect the HTML, you would see area label cart. Now, if you didn't, imagine you had terrible inaccessible 
application, then Playwright would have to find a CSS selector and it would be really ugly. But then you go, I need to fix my application and improve my code. Leave one down there. Um, so Playwright would automatically look for the most accessible roles. It will use chaining and filtering as well to, to find those. And, um, and yeah, it makes it easier because you don't have to learn those accessible roles. It will filter them, find them out for you. So make your code as, as good as possible. Uh, Max, just here in the front. Okay. Can you run like a headless, headless test? Like, you know, instead of opening the browser, you mm -hmm. can do the same things. Yeah, so we're opening code, right? the browser so, here because it's nice to see things. But I on know, CI, but can you do like a headless all of in it. memory? Like, you know, you don't need to open the browser, right? But you yeah, can yeah, show. you can just you can just run the test using the terminal by it default. Will, it will just show it. And you can also like on CI CD, it runs in headless. So so all our browsers, Chromium, Firefox and WebKit by default run on headed. This means much more. It's much more efficient to run them headed. No graphical user interfaces need to be rendered, and you can run them as well on Linux. This makes sense because Linux is the cheapest CI environment, right? So you can all run all your tests there on Linux, even WebKit. I see. A question over there. Yes, there, there. Yes, there is an update in the configuration. Yeah. So we have five minutes. So folks on the folks on the chat. Um, Amazing question. Keep your questions coming. One thing we'll make sure we do, I can stay after for anyone who would, I think this is the end of the session. I know there's a party, but we also still owe you some demos. Um, that app demo as well has all the, a, a whole bunch of demos, um, but we'll make sure that we also get you some uh, online for Azure Load and Chaos Studio. Um, we follow the practice of using like data test attributes or um, attributes that are specific to testing as selectors. Um, if we write our tests using recordings like this, is there any way to prioritize those attributes as the selectors? Yes. So Play Playwright's uh, code chain has a selector engine included, which is not using AI. I want to outline that, but we <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not not yet. But but we are using like an kind of an algorithm with a prioritization logic. So test IDs rank very high up. So if you use test IDs on your DOM nodes, we will always use DOM, uh, get test IDs. So it's page.get by test ID and your test ID at the end. So it will choose the test ID before the roll-up button? Yes. There you go. Excellent. So yeah, so you asked the question of on, online, they asked, you know, how do we get the QAs to write tests? That's what they do. They press a button. Now we do have to write the assertions, right? That's the only thing. Again, I would love the engineers to be able to just make the assertions happen when I click on it, but that, that's not possible yet, maybe one day. But right now, obviously we need to like make sure and assert that there's something in the cart or that the price is what it should be. So most of the hard work is done and then you just have to come along, write a few assertions and then you're good to go. And all our assertions with Playwright, they automatically retry so you don't end up, if there is some asynchronous work going on, for example, you fetch some network request, they will retry until the condition is met, for example, that a specific element has some text or the timeout is reached. This is only for UI. For yes, so Playwright is only for web application testing. Everything what happens inside the browser mm -hmm. can be tested with Playwright. I can't hear you, I apologize. So for API testing, I'll take that one offline. Um, you can, through Playwright, use the API. You can use, you yes, can do yes, use yes, Playwright yes, to Playwright do API well. tests. But we also have a, a very strong partnership with Postman um, and then the APIM. So uh, did want to make sure that you hit that as well. Um, so it depends on what level of API testing you want to do. But I'd also love to hear from you also uh, what kind of testing you'd love to do there, because that's another area that I think there's some Okay, so some of the areas that I'm uh, looking to explore are some of the fuzzing around API testing. Like how do we actually integrate fuzzing to help you with sort of really truly a chaos at the API level, but also that security fuzzing, so. And I wanna point out, someone just put in the chat there as well, for any other kind of playwright stuff, there is an on-demand session and you can go back and you can show your team that as well. And you can like go back and watch the on-demand session, which I pre-recorded which basically goes through this UI mode and goes through all those features. So definitely check that out, get your team to check it out, get them on board. As soon as you show it to your team, to your developers, they're all gonna wanna use Playwright, I, I know it. 
And we it, also it, have the Azure load testing on demand. So yes. yeah. <laughs> like, everything on demand. And, and, well, no, it's in the chat. It's, <laughs> it's literally and, right and there. And for the people in Seattle or online as well, tomorrow we have inside the Microsoft Reactor in Redmond a meetup going on with Playwright QA uh, engineers as well. So if you want more Playwright, we've got it for you. And you can also watch on YouTube um, in your own hotel room or wherever you are. So you can you know, do that for the comfort of your home. Just check it out on the Playwright uh, YouTube channel. You can get that all there. And uh, I don't know, do you, uh, do you have any other questions before we click, quickly close up? Because I know the party's on and everyone wants to go partying and Jen wants to dance. No, I'd like to, if anyone <laughs> would like to stay after and do some Azure Load, I'm happy to stay in the room and do some rapid de demos. Because um, I know that that was one of the topics, but it, it's hard to put all these testing topics together. There's so, so much to talk about. There is so to much to talk about. But it's been an amazing audience. All right. Want to thank everybody online as well. Thank you so much. There's a lot of questions we'll still get to. Um, and folks in the room, thank you so much, uh, especially for the great discussion. Thank you so much.